All right. Um, good morning, everyone. <laughs> so today, again, we're going to look at advanced printing techniques. Today is lecture three. And for today, our topic will be around designing for digital and offset printing. So we're going a little bit deeper into how to craft communication for print. Um, and what we'll do is we'll focus on digital. However, we will um, also look at offset because offset um, does have a little more, it's a bit more complex in terms of the finishing, considerations, and so on and so forth. So for today's topic, we will be tackling several things, a lot of things. <laughs> so we'll go through an overview of um, CMYK and RGB differences, just so to refresh your mind from last uh, week's uh, lecture. We will also speak about, um, you know, rich black, standard black, what is what, and just to demonstrate what you need to avoid when it comes to rich black text. Um, we'll also look at standard black and what standard black would mean. We'll also learn how to create solid black. Um, and this is sort of what is preferred in the market so that, you know, you don't get things wrong when you're going to print. And then we'll also look at bright colors, um, for now, we won't look at many different types of colors from a COEK perspective, but it'll be nice to just for you to know um, a little bit about how to create, you know, um, the basic bright color swatches. Then we'll talk about transparency effects and soft and spot colors. Um, and then we'll also look at print file setup checks that you need to make when you're going to print. And they differ depending on whether you're going to be doing offset printing or digital printing. And then we'll finally close with color variants. So I think that's the sequence for this lecture. Um, it should take around an hour. So next slide, please. So for CMYK and RGB, um, we did a very thorough analysis about these two different um, uh, color spaces. And we had mentioned that whereas CMYK is for print material, the RGB is mainly for screen, right? For screen devices like computer screens and so on and so forth. So we definitely discussed a lot more about, you know, what CMYK means, which is cyan, magenta, yellow, and B is key. And then for RGB, we also spoke about um, it standing for red, green, and blue. And it really is the color you see on your computer. And I think we also went at great lengths to explain how um, what you see on screen is not necessarily what you find from an output point of view, right? So always bear this in mind um, so that when you are sending work to your printer, always know you need to convert everything into CMYK. So don't send a printer RGB work because what will happen is it will not register right. You need to change it into CMYK and make all your adjustments on the artwork based on CMYK for you to send because you'll see some colors doing something. Right. So the next part is to discuss um, what to avoid, which is essentially rich black text. Now, before I share with you an example, I want to explain what rich black is. So rich black is when you mix cyan, magenta, yellow, and key all in one artwork, and you're saying that color is black. In your mind, you're saying it's black, right? So basically what people do is they go onto the picker tool and slide the picker all the way to the to the bottom or top where black seems to be and they pick it as black. Avoid doing that because what happens is you will find in instances, especially when it's being used um, often on a document or in fine print, you'll notice that that black doesn't look like a true black, right? So um, there is so imagine if a printer is printing and there's a slight shift of these two of these four colors so for, perhaps cyan skips a bit or magenta skips a bit what you'll notice is you'll notice that there's something called ghosting that will occur and you know it won't be that black it'll just have this like shadow next to primarily text particularly in small small letters that normally happens because you see letters are very different shapes and a printer can tend to skip so what we need to avoid is to mix all these cmyk to make the black and instead 
just go put 000 on C, M, Y, and then on key, you put 100% um, black because that's essentially to get a proper black registration without anticipating you know, something disastrous, particularly if you're doing a publication. Imagine doing a whole publication and you print with this um, rich black text and what happens is then you start seeing very interesting blends of color instead of actually the actual true black. So, so just be careful because it could create registration problems. So the next slide just shows you what I was talking about, which is an example of rich black doing some ghosting drama. And that's because um, the magenta skipped from registering exactly on top of each other. So this is something to keep in mind and it's extremely important. Check your publications for rich black and remove rich black and instead use standard black, right? So standard black is the preferred, um, next slide, please. Um, and what standard black is, it's simply that the K um, is 100%, right? Or if you want to create, say, a grayscale, you can then, you know, go 90, 80%, um, 70%, and so on, up to one, right, to a scale of one. So the idea is you can also determine the type of black by just focusing on, on that one um, parameter, which is adjusting the K, and not necessarily the full spectrum of CMYK. I hope I'm clear. Um, now, this is not to say <laughs> um, that you can't use rich black. So, uh, so all I'm saying is avoid it, particularly when you're looking at very small texts, like a publication, avoid it. But if you want an extremely rich black, definitely mixing CMYK is really good because what happens is you get a very good um, richer more saturated black like it's deeper um, but I think care needs to be taken when you're considering what paper type you're using because if you're using a paper that really um, soaks a lot of ink it could blot on that paper or it could oversaturate that paper and cause even things like you know smears and, and things like that so the idea is just to understand that Preference is standard black. And if you go on to the next slide, you can see, um, you know, the different takes of. So the first half um, from the K, key, K uh, sorry, key is 100 all the way to key is 10. That's standard, um, that's standard black, right? However, from the 30, 30, 30, that's CMY, and then the key is 100. All the way to the last one where there's CMY, which is 555, five, five, and then keys 10, those that spectrum is actually rich black. And I think you can notice that the rich black is definitely more appealing, but um, preference for text would be to use standard black. So it may look the same to a lay person, but you know, from a printer perspective, they're very different colors. Now, the other thing is to note, and this is sort of a trick I'd advise you is. If you're looking at printing a business card that's a one color, always ensure you make it then standard black, which is the black. If it's a black that's the one color, make sure it's standard because what happens is it's cheaper to print like that. But if you send a printer um, the rich black colors and tell, and tell him it's one color, he'll be like, no, I'm seeing I have four plates here to make. My C, M, Y, K, has they all have color so what that means is they'll charge you more they'll charge it they'll charge you like a full color job but sometimes they don't tell you they'll be like hmm, okay we'll charge a full color job but if you tell them particularly when you're doing offset that you want a one color job and the one color job is 100 percent black it's standard black they will be able to create just the one plate right for your offset printing so this of course only works for offset printing because that's where they they make um, plates for each color. However, of course, for digital printing, we do know they'll print, you know, what you see is what you get, basically. They'll print normally from the digital printer. So next slide. Um, so I think we have sort of um, had a look at rich black and standard black. Um, but there's a recommendation of of what sort of a rich black you can create eh? so if you want like sort of a very rich black consider um, 
using 30 cyan percent 30 percent magenta 30 percent yellow and 100 percent black and if you go back to your slide when you're looking at the colors you will actually see um that it is richer right this color mix will be much much richer and um and what that means is that the ink coverage will also be 190 percent because what what it is is just adding the percentages so it'd be much deeper if you look back you'll see it's much richer right than a hundred percent key right do you notice that yeah so so this is you can use this value um, and then it also says you know with digital printing you don't need as much ink to achieve a good black solid so avoid the <laughs> you know like <laughs> Um, too much cyan, too much magenta, too much yellow, and too much black. Because really, um, I've already told you what the issues are. But also, when you're looking at finishing with a lamination, it really... Um, you, sorry, you may want to consider doing a lamination because what happens is it tends to smear. That color tends to... Because, you know, you're packing a lot of color on top of each other. So if you're considering... If you really love that rich black, great but then consider using a lamination, right? So that then now it doesn't smear off and so on and so forth. So anyway, we'll go to the next, um, so I think enough of, you know, the solid black um, and, and rich black. I think now you understand the difference. So we'll look a little bit about also CMYK bright colors. So um, I don't know if you've seen, and this is sort of, of course, there, there are two things that happen when you see a, a piece of communication that has very rich colors coming through one is of course you need to understand your colors but also um, there, there are certain colors that are really deep and bright and so the idea is to know what they are like what the what like for example if you want a very deep bright red what is that from a CMYK perspective you know and and the beauty is now particularly if you're using Adobe we now have a color swatch, right? So it's very easy to pick what these colors are. But it'll also be nice for you to also understand how to create them, right? So and, and so that it's easy for you to just, of course, you know, know how to mix and blend and get the right color. So although CMYK may never quite reach the backlit brilliance of RGB, it is possible to create color combinations that will ensure sort of these vivid, rich colors that you see. Right. Um, of course, there are other things that people do, like they add filters, or they do a nice spot vanish on top of, of they do a vanish on top of the communication. But it will be nice for you to also understand how to achieve this. So, for example, if you go to the next page, um, so we'll just go through some of these bright colors, and uh, so that you see how they are very easy to achieve by you quickly just filling in the the tabs. So, for example, if you want hundred percent pure red. Um, or a rich, rich red, let me say a rich red, perhaps just do my magenta and cyan as 100%. Magenta, sorry, and yellow as 100%. For orange, it would be 60% orange, 60% uh, magenta, 100% yellow. For a nice um, yellow-orange color, you would say perhaps magenta is 30, yellow is 100. And then, of course, a nice bright yellow, not being too too bright till you can't see it, it's almost white, you'd perhaps add a pop of magenta by putting a 5% magenta, and then of course the yellow is 100%. For a nice rich pink, you would do cyan as 5%, and then the magenta 100%. For green, it would be cyan 100 and yellow 100. You get this rich bright green. And then for a blue, like a sky blue, you do 100% magenta, and to sort of bring it up a bit so that it doesn't really become so bland and and light you put a little bit of magenta 15 percent then for a nice rich like sort of regal blue you would do cyan as 100 and then magenta 70 percent for purple it will be cyan 60 and magenta 100 so look at how close those color values are it's like sort of like a switch between the blue and the purple with a 10 percent difference and then Finally, a nice pink, a nice, you know, what they call baby pink. You perhaps want to do zero uh, cyan and magenta would be the 30%. So this is sort of a trick that, you know, you can, to get rich sort of clean, bright colors, it's always nice to always ensure that you have some 
zeros on some of the values if you realize that's how you get a rich bright color that you only play up only two colors right combinations whereas if you start putting you know other combinations where you fill sort of the full cmyk you kind of get dirtier or murkier colored colors i don't know if i'm making sense um, are we together and, and that's why if you look at lulu kitololos i'll give an example Lulu Kitololo is very good at colors, picking colors, because she knows that bright colors always are captivating. So she always ensures that she's just not picking on her color picker a color. No. She's literally checking to see which of these colors would be the most vibrant or would pop. She literally has to understand how CMYK works, right, for her to choose her colors. Look at Lulu Kitololo's work. She's like the power she's like a color queen in my eyes because she knows how to get um colors bright and it's very deliberate you can see she really has mastered color coordination so i think we're clear there so we'll move on to transparency and spot colors um so i am not a big fan of transparencies let me just be honest <laughs> and why that is is because once you start printing transparencies you realize they are only good on screen, right? Um, they are never quite good on paper. Like, um, and that's just through experience, but I think there are people who don't mind having transparencies on print as on their print jobs, but for me, I always tell people, mm, refrain, <laughs> perhaps use gradients, but I'm not sure about transparencies. I'm not a big fan of it, but anyway, let's just discuss transparencies because this is something you may want to think about. So one of the things that you need to look at is um, is look at your software's color palette um, that it's only using CMYK. So this is important because different softwares have different color palettes. Just to ensure you look at that. And um, because if you use other ICCs or other color spaces, so for example, some type of Pantone, you know, coating something, you may not achieve the transparencies as you think you would, right? So you may not achieve those transparencies. But CMYK can achieve some level of transparency with no problem. Also, if you're importing a logo or a piece of artwork with a predefined Pantone or spot color, make sure that you also import that color into your palette. Um, and the best way to also do this is to also change it into a CMYK. So I'll, I'll, I'll explain to you why. So mostly when you're doing offset printing, it's always known as a full color job if CMYK have color. So if you have colors ranging from CMYK, that's a full color job, right? However, you could decide to do spot colors, right? So don't mix the two. So if you decide you want to go with spot colors, which is a Pantone color, for example, say Safaricom's Pantone is 336C, right, coated. Don't mix, um, don't, like, especially on InDesign, don't mix spot colors and CMYK. Just convert that color to CMYK if you already have the CMYK colors, right? Um, however, the, it, it, it is nice if, okay, so it's okay to actually have a spot color with, say, a black, 100% black, because, you know, black is really a dominant color. So it is possible to just have like key as a hundred and you have a two color job with a pantone color so you can tell your printer i have a two color job and therefore they'll charge it um, a little bit more affordably because all they're doing is two plates a spot color and a black however if there's any other color outside black please just convert the entire document into cmyk meaning the pantone 336c uh, which is perhaps a spiral green and if it is a green, you would then need to convert it into CMYK so that your whole document is a CMYK. So that when they are creating the plates, you know, the plates are consistent. They, they pick the colors properly, right? Because they are, they are all rhyming, right? So, so now in terms of transparency, if you apply a spot color to text or graphics and use a transparency effect on them, it will result in the object printing black or with an unintended an color. Now, this is when you actually have things like pantones playing in your, in your, in your artwork. 
right? So just make sure that the entire, if you're planning to do our transparency, always remember everything needs to be CMYK. So you go picking every single color and checking that it's a CMYK to CMYK, right? Not some Sidri are, particularly if you're going, if you're working on InDesign, not that some are RGB, others are CMYK, then you have a bad tone there, I mean, don't do that. Because when you print that publication, you will see a totally interesting color because what you've done is you've not matched the color spaces you're using. So, mm. so, um, so essentially, the job may print fine on a desktop printer or you can create a print file that appears fine. However, um, when you create a transparency with this sort of mismatch of colors on your artwork, you're most likely to be able to, um, you're most likely to be able to see something strange happening, right? And um, it may not look like what your original file looked like. So again, iterating, you must convert your spot color to a CMYK um, in your original file before you export it into a PDF or before you send it to a printer so that, you know, they print the right thing. Because what you're doing is you're confusing the printer. Because imagine if you have a green here that's a Pantone, then you have a mix of a certain green in another CMYK color. Now it's wondering what green... Um, um, color space should I use? Should I use the Pantone green or should I use the same IK green? So just be very, very, very um, keen about that and particularly when you've also added transparencies. But as I said, avoid transparencies. Just, um, it never registers as you see it on screen. It could either go lighter or it could either go so dark. I've seen very many um, errors happening because of just transparency. Like, for example, you could create a transparent, like a solid color and then put a transparency element on the background and then write text on top that, are, that is white, right? So what happens is when you print such a work, it could be that the background becomes so dark, uh, so bright, that you can't even read the white text that was on top of this background to start with because you had transparencies on it. So just be very careful, particularly if that element on top of the background was also like sort of a light, a white that you did a transparency of. You know the way you can say, I have a dark red, I'm putting a white um, element, which I'll take it down to say 10% white so that it reflects on this red surface. Then you write white text on top. What will happen is this white text might end up not being legible because it's competing with this other transparency that's right underneath. I don't know if you're getting what I mean, that sometimes Transparencies can be very tricky, and if you really must do them, make sure you actually um, do a test run before you print everything all at once. Okay, so I think we are done with color, and I think you must now be in control when it comes to color. I think depending on what the nature of your project is, please have a good command of color because these are things that I will be checking in your work. So as you choose your colors, Try and strive for clean colors, yeah, particularly if you want a bright look. Also go for um, very little transparencies, but gradients are great. But even gradients, they have their hang-ups. So make sure you know how to also put gradients um, to achieve a very nice seamless look. But today we'll not discuss gradients because I, I think it's pretty much sort of, you know, it's, a, it's, it's an exploratory exercise, uh, right? So we can do it if you'd like to know more about uh, gradients happy to share with you a demonstration but for now we'll now jump to now proper now just before you're about to um, take your work for to a printer so remember um, when we're discussing print file checks we need to be at the very end of the artwork process meaning we've gotten an approval or we are happy with what we've done if it's our own personal work and we've done all the checks that I've talked about when it comes to color, because color is always the biggest issue when you go to print, right? Now, there are other factors that you need to consider when you're looking at going for print. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to highlight a few things. However, the trip that we will be taking on in the next two weeks will give you a very good picture of what is usually considered when we go to print. So, so when you start out as a designer, you need to at least be able to check these four elements, the first four, and the first four factors are how many number of pages are you printing? So for example, if it's a notebook like this, you need to be certain how many pages these are. My guess is that they're 50, and 
it's not indicated. But my guess is this is a 50 page notebook, right? So always know that. Then the, num the page size and format. So in this instance, for this notebook, this is a A5 proper, right? And it's um, portrait in orientation, right? Right? Um, paper size also informs the orientation. So you always need to be telling the printer it's portrait oriented. Otherwise, what will happen? They'll, if you say orientation, if you don't say what orientation, they could decide to bind like this. So you never, you don't ever uh, second guess yourself or don't ever let the printer um, be the one to dictate the specifications. Always know that your artwork needs to match what is going to be printed, but you also need to lay out the specification because of course these spirals are not going to be in your artwork, right? So you need to inform on how the orientation is, right? And then you will also inform on the color mode. I think I've already mentioned this. If it's going to be a one color job, like in this instance, this is a one color job, the inner page, believe it or not. It could be that they used the bright blue, right? Which is the 30 cyan it could no actually 100 percent it could be a spot color a spot color blue that they've used meaning it's a one color job and why people go with one color jobs it's much much more affordable because this is one plate right whereas if it was a full color type of blue what would happen is imagine they'd have to have you know the offset printer would have to have the, the, the four plates right to make the cmyk colors that make that color and then of course you'd also need to look at um the format now let me just discuss a little bit about the format before we go to the other the other two the last two so format really informs on what you want to achieve as well right so in this instance let me discuss a little bit about the format of this notebook so it's definitely a kasuku notebook which has a hard cover and you see it's a carton and it's a carton cover so the format would inform this so on your specification you would say Yes, it's an A4, it's an A5 orient, uh, portrait oriented notebook, spiral bound, but it also has a a cardboard um, cover, right? Printed one side, and this is full color. I think if it's not full color, it's two color, which I have a feeling it is a two color job. So what they've done is they are very clever. They used a shade of red, and then they used this is now transparency. I see now while saying transparency comes to play. So they used one red, one shade of red. So say it's a pan, so say it's a, it's a 100% red. I'm just giving an example. What they've done is they've used different gradients of that red to achieve those feathers. And then the black is 100% black. Are you seeing what, what they've done? So chances are this is a two color plate. So again, they're saving on cost because they're gonna do print runs of thousands of these now. So they keep their, their costs down so that their margins, their profit margins increase, right? And then, of course, this paper is very different, as you can see, from the inner pages. So whereas this could be 150 GSM, the paper cartridge paper here could be 100 or 80 GSM. Because you see the difference. This is light, this is heavier. And then, of course, another cover on the back, which is a blank cardboard which is even heavier than the first one. If you look at this, the grammage of this is not the same as the grammage of this. Whereas this one is essentially perhaps 125 to 150. This one you're talking about 200 GSM. I'd like to just feel the difference so that you see what I mean. So again, format now informs what is going, what is going to be the final product or the final output of your item. And you need to inform everything about it. So saying, is it spiral binding? Is it perfect binding? Because those are two totally different types of binding modes. Um, you know, and then also the number of pages. So you'd say for pagination, it's 50 pages inside. So making a total of, this is a, this is a 54 page book. Because when you count pages, even this is a page. So you would say, this book is a 54 pager because this is page one, that's page two, and that's page three, that's page four. So most publications, in fact, all publications, are counted pages in multiples of four. So there are two ways you can describe the format. You can say 
this is a 54 page booklet end to end from cover to cover or you could say this is a 50 page book plus a cover back and back and front cover so you it doesn't matter what you say um, but essentially if the paper of this of the cover is different normally you would go with the latter you would say it's a 50 page uh, booklet with plus a back and front cover right and the back and front cover you then define the specifications separately are we clear mm -hmm. it's very important to get this because everything is actually printed with specifications exact to spec and what people do is if you're not sure always ask your printer to give you sample paper types so that what you're doing is perhaps you compare it with something else with something like an ideal like say you have a book that you really love and you want to achieve a similar look then go with the printer one and the actual one that you really like and compare paper by feeling it or looking at the texture so that by the time you get back to your printer you're exactly specifying what it is you'd like to achieve I hope I'm being very clear this is extremely important um, particularly when you're outputting for print it doesn't matter what, whether it's a photo album whether it's a notebook whether it's a business report whether it's an annual report whether it's a banner you always need to understand what material you're using then for finishes I'll discuss so this finishes is extremely vast and what I'm suggesting is we leave it for the 14th of April we will be visiting Ramco and we will get a deeper understanding of what finishes are but finishes are basically what is applied after printing has been done before they do the final chopping of the, the, the output product and if it's binding that needs to be bound or if it needs to be stapled saddle stitched that is and so on and so forth so the finishes are very many different types for this lecture we will just discuss one type of finish right so that you can actually see one um, and how it looks so that you're able to you, you're able to identify it right so so the and then the final point about the factors is you also need to understand the use of of that piece of communication I'll also explain what use of communication is so for example do you think a sailor will be able to use this notebook why? Um, so water. Correct. So the idea is that every time you send specifications to a printer, always also mention, if you're not clear, what the use for that communication will be. So for example, if this is going to be a sailor's notebook, for sure that cover and the back cover should be waterproofed. Right? So what waterproofing means will depend on also what's in your budget. So, of course, if you say, oh, I want it to be oil-skinned, I don't know, leather, I mean, okay. Very few like very few printers have oil-skinned leather, um, like oil-treated leather. So, of course, you would perhaps consider other, other different types of materials. There are different types of papers that don't soak up um, any water at all. Um, and that's, I guess, when the notebook lands like this. Um, perhaps you want it to go with a sleeve. It enters into an insert that is you know so the idea is to actually first appreciate where it's gonna be used so that when you're making your your request to print you also include certain um, considerations and perhaps your printer will be able to guide you on what exactly they can help you with so for example I'm assuming they'll advise you to do a proper um, lamination so that at least it doesn't get wet and soak and, and tear right that is a basic thing that can be done including the back the back could also be that it's not really cut on but it's a different type of paper which they can be able to laminate so again always remember the use of that piece of communication that's what I mean by that so if you're designing with programs like Adobe um, please ensure that your files are also very consistent and that simply means also manual checks like for example if your numbering is gonna appear here in the middle bottom and you go to a certain page the number is somewhere here surely that registration is off right your pagination should always appear at the exact same place 
so always just do a, like a check eh? like tap 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 always check is it on the line things are aligned and so on and so forth and any other inconsistencies that you can see like color inconsistencies please check and ensure that you made all the corrections because once you send something to the printer that's that right so I've already discussed with you um, finishes so I'm just going to show you one for a book cover what a spot varnish spot UV varnish would look like UV being ultraviolet um, and I guess it informs on the method how the method through which they do put a spot color on a piece of communication so one thing that you need to know is that whenever you have like a publication that has many pages and there's a specific page you want it to have um, a, like a finish then that file that artwork you you save it as a separate file so for example if we wanted the cover on this notebook this is a kasuku. if we wanted this kasuku to be um, what was spot vanished we would save this cover artwork on a separate file and not the same in design file or the same illustrator file as the notebook pages that are here we would save it and then we would indicate um, on the artwork where the spot UV vanish is by using only one of the colors that is within the CMYK spectrum so I'll explain if you want Kasuku to be the one that is spot vanished you would change that black because on the artwork it would be black onto 100% C cyan so it would be all the light blue that is 100% cyan and then indicate on the email that the place where the spot vanish is is where the 100% cyan is because you see of course there's no way on <laughs> illustrator you can indicate here is the spot vanish right so you choose any color it could also be just 100% magenta but in this instance, because you already have magenta happening across the artwork, you may want to look, go with cyan, right? Because that will stand out more. Are we clear? So pick that part. So if you go to the next page, you will see um, a few examples of how spot colors can really make a, a, a product look extremely um, beautiful. Like in the instance of this, um, the notebook on the top right, uh, sorry, top left, you can see those stars instead of them being color like i'm imagining someone would have said well let's do gray a gray star they've just blown them up and then they've told the the, the printer spot they want a spot um a spot uv vanish on it you see how it achieves a very premium luxurious look um also for the business card the one that says right light republic photography this could be the back of the person the, the the business owner of the photography company so the bar what they've done is yes they have a one it's a two color job with a spot uv and and whereas the booklet or the notebook is just a spot uv with no text because i'm assuming that could be an identity or a logo for a company this one they've they've used two colors that's the color that looks like a cyan on the logo and then for photography they have a white color then they have the spot vanish on the pattern, on the floral pattern that's on the artwork. Look at it again at how beautiful card that card looks like. Um, in comparison to you having gone with say I don't know, um, like a light, like a light grey, to, to again you know to like sort of um, to to go around this logo and identity. So again, um, start looking for new ways. To make a piece of communication look beautiful and as, as i told you our client will never come and tell you do for me a uv spot vanish because they don't know what it is it's for you to advise them how it would look and perhaps show them examples like this for them to know how their the end art out out artwork would look like or at least ask your printer to give you samples of how these finishes look like because and there are many types of finishes this is just one like this one looks like a raised both of them are raised uv spot vanish right but you could actually do two things as well. You could also decide to emboss and spot vanish on an emboss. Do you know that? You can either emboss upwards, extruding, or depressed, and again do a spot vanish on it. So there are many, in this instance, I think what happened was it sort of, it's slightly raised, right? Because, you know, it's, it's an, it, it, they, they made it slightly raised, uh, particularly for the card, right? 
because you can see that the logo is depressed, right? You can see it's slightly lower. Whereas the notebook, it's just a normal spot vanish. Are you understanding what I mean? So you can also ask for bevel, bevel effects created by um, on the card alongside a spot vanish. So it's, you can continue the specifications on and on. You can even add die cuts, meaning the card could have rounded corners and so on and so forth. But remember, for each finish, the cost keeps going up. So again, <laughs> don't overdo the finishes because what happens is um, you don't save much. You spend more, right? Because for every process, it's a different step in the print cycle. And what they're doing is they're adding into your costs, right? And you see a little bit more of this, right? So we'll then now jump to um, bleeds. For me, I think bleeds is very important eh, because I don't see it in most people's works. Not done anymore. You know, you always expect your printer to do for you bleeds, right? But I think it's important for you to master bleeding. Um, and so every time you, you prepare your work for output and... For, for example, you know, like this notebook has bleeds. Your artwork, you want it to go off the page, right? You must add bleeds. Otherwise, what will happen is if you don't add the bleed, remember the print paper is bigger than your artwork. What will happen is sometimes you'll just see your artwork starting in the middle here. Instead, just like the way digital printers do it, right? You can never get a, a bleed on a digital on a home office digital printer. So always make sure that the artwork you're giving them is always um, has a bleed. Eh? Now the bleed, I think, as you've seen uh, in this instance where we have an artwork that's a portrait artwork. They say, and the recommended size of a bleed is three mm. In this country, we use millimeters, right, or centimeters. So just always just add, right. Um, Add your bleeds and then stretch your, your color band to go into the, the 3 mm space. Um, also, it's recommended that you see, you see this distance on this dot between here and here. Always make sure that you have nothing happening around 8 to 6 mm. Minimum is 6 mm. Nothing is happening off the edge because what will happen is when they're doing the cutting and chopping of your, of your document, they could nick off an artwork. If your artwork comes right close so whenever you're preparing artwork add your bleed lines and also add your margin lines particularly I've seen business cards that don't look right they've cut because someone went right to the edge you can see that there's something that's gonna be cut so always maintain a 6 mm margin um, from the edge so that you know you don't get this um, chopping of work right so I don't know if there's anything else here that um, isn't clear, but I think those are the two things that I think are really important to consider, right? And always finally create outlines um, to your artwork if it's done on Illustrator. So output artwork, even when you're doing the motifs that we're doing for this class, if there's any text, create outline, right? If there's text. If this and if you're using InDesign, package your work because elements could be missing. If you send someone a PDF, they open it, some things could be missing, like some you know, some things you placed on the artwork, say they were images, they could easily not get to the printer because that file was not embedded in the artwork. So what you need to do is either create outlines, or so actually there are two things. Create outlines if you have text and package your work or embed your images before you send the artworks to your printers. So that then now, they're not calling you to tell you, we are, we are missing things, the elements that are missing on this um, artwork, and they don't have them, because what they're seeing is a big X. I think you understand what I mean, right? Um, the other thing that you need to be keen on is to always ensure that um, you always share a JPEG on the email of how the artwork looks like. So that when they're looking at the actual artwork file which is the high-res file they are comparing the jpeg with what they are opening on their end because it could be that you can send them a jpeg and that's how they'll be able to know that they're missing elements because you can imagine if they're missing elements and they did know they were missing elements you know them they they don't know what was on the artwork any or what you intended to achieve on the artwork 
They just print what they see. But the beauty of these systems is now they give alerts. They're like, whenever you open the file, it will always prompt you and tell you there's a missing link here. Look for the link. So they'll always call you back to tell you, send this artwork um, because it's missing from the file. Right? So I hope that's clear. So add your bleeds, create outlines on text, as well as ensure you package your files. Now, we'll just discuss a little bit about um, offset printing um, and a little bit about digital printing. Now, why I'd like to discuss offset printing is where is because offset printing has its merits and you will encounter it. And also digital printing has its merits, pros and cons. Both have pros and cons. So be very clear um, from the onset um, about which type of printing you're going to be going with. So let me first describe what offset printing is. So offset printing is also called lethal. In fact, from the word lithography, I think you've heard of the term. It was the first original type of sort of contemporary printing before we now got into mainstream digital printing, right? So it's a traditional printing method, but it is very consistent. What I like about it is that you can't go wrong. You know, you can put plates aside for years and years and achieve the same color registration. It's much more perfect than digital printing, right? So your image is transferred by ink from a metal printing plate to a rubber blanket, and then from that rubber blanket to the paper. Um, and this really um, achieves that clean print look, right? So it may be more complex because of course, with offset printing, as you may know, you have plates that they need to do what they call ori origination. Uh, so it takes longer to complete because you need to sign a proof from that plate before they do the full batch. But it is a process that you'd like to consider for long runs or runs that you keep doing in the future because those plates can stay with the printer for many years. And every time you need to replenish your print run, you can just ask them to go back to their files, they remove the plates, and they, they print again the exact same thing. So of course it's great when that one thing is printed over and over and over and over again. Like for example, business cards, right? So business cards is a very good example. Um, for offset printing, or even publications, like a book, like a, like a novel, a book that won't really change. The edition won't change until, you know, 10 years later or five years later. So that's something that you'd want to consider, offset printing, right? Um, now, the thing is with offset printing, it's also a better option when you're looking at bulk because digital print, because of the economies of scale, digital print tends to be extremely expensive when you're printing, a, a huge print run whereas in offset print your margins are kind of you know you you kind of squeeze your cost because what happens is the original the uh, origination the origination of the plate is what is at cost but then now they only give you a cost now for the the number of paper the, the amount of paper you're using and so on whereas digital printers have inks that are extremely expensive so what you're doing is like you're paying not just for the paper but also the inks which are really really expensive so perhaps start thinking of of, um, of offset when you're also looking at um, printing in thousands. So for example, you have a huge organization of 3,000 3, uh, members. Say for example, Safaricom or Coca-Cola, everyone needs a business card, at least 500 pieces. So you see, 500 pieces times 3,000 members of staff, that means those, that, those um, okay, let me just say even like 1,000 of those members of staff need business cards. You're printing in thousands, so definitely consider offset printing. Now, yes, um, so we'll go to the next one. So digital printing, on the other hand, is very different. It's much more modern. It is definitely now becoming, you know, uh, ubiquitous to printing. So most people don't even talk about offset printing because uh, I guess there's a decline of printing, right? Because everyone's on, on their screens. Um, so printing batches are becoming smaller and smaller as we move away from paper and therefore the beauty of the printing the the digital technology for printing is that they they've also become faster and faster right so print runs are done you know the printer is fed the paper and quickly it prints unlike offset printing where perhaps it's not as fast um as as digital printing so i guess here the the request from you as a designer is to always go to the best so i've seen a lot of people who say 
Ah, me, I want to save costs. I'm going to River Road to print my work. You print with a digital printer who's saying they're charging you 50 cents. What happens? You get work that doesn't look great. The registration is off. There's dirt all over the artwork. There is, I don't know, um, your green looks light green. Your jungle green looks brown. You know what I mean? Like now, you're wondering, what did I do? So it just is... Um, a question of the type of printer so always go with a high-end company a company that has quality machinery like high-end digital technology printers because you will achieve good quality print um, thereafter because if you use a shortcut what happens is you'll pay less yes but your client will be upset and you may need to redo so my advice is um, consider digital printing um, with with of course um, printers who have very good quality machines um, and then consider it only when you're doing small print runs in the hundreds. So, for example, 100 business cards, um, 20, 70 brochures, um, or, you know, 500 um, uh, DL size leaflets. You can consider digital printing. Um, it's fast, it's quick, you know. Overnight, your work is done. However, and also timeline, if it's something that you need real quickly, um, because it's also expensive. But if you really need, if you really have big batches, don't consider digital printing. I promise you. Because one, you spend a lot of money. Two is that sometimes long runs with digital print, you always get variations in the print. Like you've seen in your normal home printer. You print your first 40 pages, they look great. Eh, after, the 40, after the 40th page, you start seeing a deterioration of the quality of print because now the ink is ending, right? Whereas in offset, hardly do you get that unless just the ink was not set right or whatever reason. But because it's plates, you know, it's how it's it's first, it's a plate transferring onto a blanket and then it's now putting it onto the paper. So so the thing is, um, it'll be nice for you to look at these processes and consider them when you're advising your clients on which type of printing you'd like to recommend for them. So always remember the factors. Remember how many pieces um, a client needs for you, for it to inform on what type of printing you'll be going for, right? So, in a nutshell, digital um, press typically offers a faster turnaround, as I'd mentioned, than offset press. Consider digital print for few numbers, as I'd mentioned, something below 20, 50, even 100 pieces is really small from a, from a print perspective. And also quick, small jobs, like you need things have an event tomorrow consider printing digital because you know we are we're only printing a few pieces or even presentations for a meeting you're only handing in a few pieces consider digital printing i mean you'd be going overboard if you considered offset whereas offset as i mentioned you'd consider other things so i want to finish with color variants because i think color variants is an important thing to consider as well um, outside just the other factors that we've spoken about. So, of course, both offset and digital printers use CMYK inks, right? Um, but their output is also very different. Like, for example, if I went to a printer and I gave them an artwork and they, they did a digital print from it, and I went to another printer and I asked for the very same thing from an offset printer, if I put those two artworks together, the colors would be did you know that it, it is because of just how I think we'd had this discussion of every single device has its own ICC profiling and then also now coupled with that is that also CMYK is registered slightly different depending on the technique you use so it will never be perfectly exact even if you were matching even if you match the colors to the T right so um, and it's just as, as it's been put here it's really about the manufacturing processes that are different that create these differences, right? So it's the other way around. So whereas digital, you get very vibrant um, colors, but you tend to get less consistent color registration. As I said, as it keeps going on and on, the color keeps, you know, like degenerating. Um, on offset, it's more consistent, but it's less vibrant. Sorry, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I, I confused it too. But yeah, so it's literally offset. 
you would go for consistency but not like a vibrant color palette whereas digital will give you that vibrance if your artwork was originally vibrant you'll get something true to what it is you saw on your screen but you know it'll be a hit or miss <laughs> as the printing goes on you might see hey, some are looking funny some are you know so so it's really sort of a compromise um, when you're doing a comparative and that's why we can't really say that one is better than the other it's because some have pros I'm sorry digital has pros and cons and also offset has pros and cons so the idea is just to get the guest uh, to use the best manufacturing or production process that's suitable for the project you're working on. Right? Are there any questions? Because I think that is the end of the lecture. I have attached a bibliography there for you to have a look at. Um, and thank you very much.